Yes, and I wanted to thank um, Breaking Convention for inviting me here and um, for hosting this panel, obviously. It's a pleasure to be here. And I understand it's a, probably a bit more clinical or scientific panel than some of the others, um, these uh, the sessions. But hopefully, I'll make it interesting enough for you guys. Um, these are my conflict of interest. And I'm going to give a very brief background on drug science and our, our medical um, psychedelic working group um, before looking at randomized controlled trials and the limitation in relation to psychedelic research and really then focusing on real world evidence approaches and naturalistic approaches and discussing what they can add to, um, to our knowledge on psychedelic um, research and how important this is and really conclude with some possible recommendation for future research. I don't know who here has heard of drug science in the audience. So well, most of you, so I don't have to <laughs> say very much about it yet. Um, but just needless to say, uh, Drug Science is a UK-based charity with an international outlook. We're working with all kinds of drugs, with drug assessment, as well as regulation, communication, harm reduction, and so on. We have a stall here led by my wonderful colleagues, Hannah and Max. So please do come and have a look at the books and the work we're doing. And I think it's important, um, especially in relation to psychedelics, really, to highlight our vision here, which is to see a world where drug control is rational and evidence-based, where drug use is better informed, and people who use drugs are understood, and where drugs are used to heal and not harm. So obviously psychedelics, as well as medical cannabis, being a case in point. Within drug science, as Ashley mentioned, we have the medical psychedelics working group and please do have a look online and check up on it um, yes very amazing consortium quite a few of the members are here today whether these are scientific experts policy experts and obviously patients and a consortium of industry partners who are offering support to us as well so um, the aim, obviously, breaking down the barriers of 50 years of medical censorship so that the vital research can continue and can actually be developed and so that patients in need are actually able to get access in the future, hopefully in the near future. And one of the key uh, working aims for that is really also to find a balance between the need for research, which I think we've seen the last few days, is still prevalent, but also the need for patient access. And in order to do this, and that's kind of the work or the project I'm presenting now, is uh, that we looked at how can we best develop the scientific evidence base. So most of you will be familiar in terms of randomized controlled trials, still the gold standard in medicine generally, obviously also in psychedelic medicine and psychedelic research. But of course, I assume many of you will be familiar with it, so I'm only running through it very um, briefly. Uh, they have quite a few limitations, some of which are general to all RCTs, some of them are more general to psychedelic trials. Um, but I think as a key point, and I think that's more, I guess, a philosophical um, perspective, you know, the presumption that RCTs can ever be completely value-free or can be completely neutral um, is actually false. So, you know, free, it can't be free from all sources of bias or um, values as well, because they all involve complex processes. And I include a few here from randomizing, blinding, controlling, implementing treatments, um, monitoring participants, analyzing the findings, communicating the findings, and plenty more. So in all these, these require these kind of different steps require obviously quite complex decisions by the researchers and by the people within the trial process who are bringing their own degree of um, bias and assumption to the process. So I think that's important for us as researchers to always keep in mind as well. 
Limitations which are general to RCTs include also, obviously, uh, their lack of ecological validity in many cases. In order to establish causality, obviously, patients have to be kind of quite uh, clean and ideally without many comor comorbidities, without other substance use or prescription medication use to an extent and other um, areas. So in many ways, this may limit the findings that we have to the, um, to non-clinical settings, to real-world settings, so to say. They're obviously time and cost-consuming, and in many ways, they still lack um, long-term um, outcomes, both of benefits and adverse events as well, or at least limited long-term outcomes. So limitations which are certainly more pronounced in psychedelic research, a key thing which has been mentioned repeatedly during um, the conference now is obviously the relative uh, small sample sizes to date still. However, you know, this is work in progress and at present there are really large scale trials and multi-site trials being planned for this year really. I would like to draw attention, though, really to the other um, kind of more specific facts in psychedelic trial, the kind of extra pharmacological factors, which we've also, which really play a particular role and which have been discussed by, for example, Balas uh, Sigeti yesterday as well. Um, so I'm going to run to them quite briefly. One of the issues is obviously related to the blinding or unblinding um, of participants and expect expectancy effects that participants in the trials may bring with them. And at least in psychedelic trials with full doses, as opposed to, say, microdoses, expectancy and blinding issues cannot really be fully avoided. You know, we have to see how to deal with this. Then the effects of the psychedelic you at full doses are usually too noticeable and the social cultural climate is too vivid. You know, we've heard a lot about the hype the last few days as well and media representation, social representations, public perceptions and so on. And obviously that does play a role when people come to these psychedelic trials. They are bringing with, the, with them a certain expectation as well. The nocebo effect in control arms can be quite pronounced as well. And so far, there is no particular gold standard in terms of which placebo to use in psychedelic trials as well. Obviously, this is all work in progress and we're seeing amazing developments here as well. Um, a lot of, you know, the confounding factors may lead to the um, over-interpretation of ex efficacy in these trials. And it is important to remember that the efficacy in a clinical trial may not be the same as the real-world effectiveness, because real-world effectiveness really may be slightly lower as well. And it, it, is, it is important, I would highlight, to incorporate some real-world evidence in that too. So psychedelics also, in addition, you know, overall, obviously have a, as we all, I think, are aware of, are not just the substance, but they are complex interplay of the substance, the set and the setting, which is quite well established. And um, so, you know, a purely typical drug development approach, isolating the substance, the kind of, as Oram termed it, pharmacological reductionism is unlikely to actually work in psychedelic research. I should refer though that I'm kind of uh, um, say that I refer to the kind of classic psychedelics, which we all know that may obviously differ in some of the newer non-psychedelic psychedelics and psychoplastogens. So I'm speaking more about the classic psychedelics here. And the key is, as we, I think, all know, you know, there's a complex interplay about the, if it's the substance with the setting, which includes the clinical applications, the interactions of patient and therapist, the various approaches, preparation, integration, as well as, I would like to say, really the individual and community beliefs and the wider social and historical um, environment in which psychedelics are embedded. And I think that's been discussed quite nicely the last few days as well. So even in a, in a, in a representative, in a, in a quite large scale um, trial, uh, the most recent one uh, with 233 participants, the authors nevertheless cautioned that the study population was not fully representative, it was insufficiently ethnically diverse, it excluded certain individuals, and it is unknown whether other preparation demonstrate the same effects. So this is obviously 
you know, quite well understood as well. So what we, can we do about it? How can we go about it? Plenty of <laughs> approaches, really. But we argue that we really need to see psychedelic medicines in the real world. I do put the real world here kind of in inverted commas as well, because obviously participants in clinical trials and clinical trials are also the real world. It's just really for lack of better wording. So if you have better wording, <laughs> let me know. So RCTs don't seem to be the only way of really studying psychedelics, may not be the only or the best way as well. Kahat Harris also termed psychedelic therapy as a whole as a kind of an inconvenient shape for the conventional medical modeling, highlighting really the fact that we might need to you know, widen our kind of scientific evidence base and look a bit broader what else is out there and what else can be used really to, bro uh, to look at scientific evidence. Um, I think I've seen, you know, I've said that research needs to place psychedelics in real world context to provide also the kind of practical conclusions. I highlight why this is the case in a minute. And in addition to kind of the limitations of the trials, I wanted to highlight like three factors, which we're also discussing. This is, by the way, a pay forthcoming paper, I should say, <laughs> so, um, which I think also uh, make the case quite nicely why we should include a certain degree of real-world evidence when looking at psychedelics. And this includes the safety of classical psychedelics, the availability and the inclusion of other knowledges. We published this paper last year, which really looked at the kind of first phase of psychedelic research and the trials that had been conducted there and the thankfully relatively rare serious adverse events there. So we have quite a lot of data in that. We also obviously have data from real world um, evidence uh, from uh, already since since a quite a long time. So in terms of safety of the classical psychedelics, physiologically, they are relatively safe. Obviously, long-term effect, psychological effect, as we had heard as well, may need to be studied. I would argue that real-world evidence certainly can be very useful in order to do that too. In terms of the availability, I think I don't have to tell this group. I mean, psychedelics are kind of widely available. Millions of US um, adults have been taking um, psychedelics, you know, not just the US, this is just a representative survey from 2019. It's quite likely that the number has increased now with the kind of availability, but also the hype, the pollen effect, the representations, and so on. So, you know, this is, you know, on the one hand, this has created issues of IP, intellectual property, which has until now at least kept large pharmaceutical companies from the field. Yet on the other hand, I would argue that it really presents an ideal background to study these, uh, these substances naturalistically in their real world context, which in turn might also term help target future clinical research, of course. Recent availability through regulated medical settings outside of RCTs offer really at this moment in time unique opportunities to look into psychedelics, to study them systematically and so on. I mean, you'll be familiar with the limited legal access in terms that is available. Retreat centers are popping up all over the world, really. There are compassionate access schemes in Canada, for example, um, exemption for religious use, decrim efforts in various states as well, which I would argue we should also look into to kind of analyze Oregon, for example, and uh, legalization of MDMA and psilocybin prescribing in Australia, of which I'm going to speak a little bit later on. So we have a lot of opportunities to actually look at the data and to actually use data that is available in addition to randomized controlled trials. And when we look at all these kind of data sources together, we have the potential to actually have a far larger database than all randomized controlled trials, participant numbers together at the moment. The reason I'm highlighting this is because looking back on uh, cannabis or the introduction of medical cannabis in the US specifically, uh, with hundreds of thousands thousands of medical patients today, but unfortunately, the data has not been analyzed kind of systematically and rigorously. There are patches of data, different states offer different kind of data analysis. It's not standardized. It's not homogeneous. So it's very difficult to draw um, conclusions or not conclusions as such comparisons, I should say. And um, at Drug Science, as you say, so we have here in the UK, and I'm just mentioning because it's relevant for Australia, hopefully. 
we have a medical cannabis registry called Project T21, where we analyze um, patients being prescribed medical cannabis. We have so far over 3,500 patients who are providing the data, obviously with consent and so on. Um, and this is establishing really interesting database and a really good analysis. So new publication, I think, coming out next week. So really, it's important to capitalize on these developments. And, the, you know, I'm underlining here through systematic and rigorous research. Additionally, I wanted to speak about the value of incorporating non-clinical knowledge. That obviously has already been a um, key topic here in the conference. So psychedelics have a very long history of use. We all know when we think of that, obviously, the indigenous communities, traditional knowledge bearers who can offer wisdom that most of us here in the West simply do not have. However, I would like to also basically highlight the kind of decade long or even longer, kind of the Western non-clinical use, subcultures, the underground and so on, who've been using and who are using psychedelics in various contexts and who can really teach us quite a lot about set and setting, harm reduction approaches and so on. So really we have the opportunities to learn from this as well and we ignore other ontologies at our peril. So this is quite a busy slide, so I'm not going to go through all of it in detail. You can read the paper when it comes out. But for our paper, we actually um, took the decision to separate real-world evidence and naturalistic studies. So you can see kind of now here how we've separated it and why. Uh, real-world evidence um, is kind of the traditional approach, incorporating all data collected from patients outside RCT settings. But these include electronic health records, administrative data, claims data, patient registers such as T21 and various more. So kind of quite quantitative still. And traditional real evidence has not included actually self-reported um, outcome data from patients, which are considered quite novel. So they're termed PROMS, patient reported outcome measures, which we include, for example, in T21. And there any report of a patient's health status that is directly reported by the patient and can measure patient symptoms, function, quality of life, and plenty more. Kind of slightly separate, but obviously interconnected in many ways, um, are the naturalistic approaches of which we have plentiful. And I'll give some examples of them in psychedelic research afterwards as well. These include large cell service, uh, interviews, case studies, observations, and so on. And they really may contribute uh, essential information to our understanding of, you know, using psychedelic harm reduction approaches, psychedelic uh, therapy approaches, and so on. And potentially, really, by triangulating uh, the, these findings and together with clinical research, we can go beyond treatment efficacy to treatment effectiveness in real-world settings. We can suggest new hypotheses, new topics. We can study particular subpopulations as well. We can indicate aspects of set and setting and treatment content for further explorations in RCTs, so complementary. And obviously, importantly, we can also highlight safety concerns and adverse events. So this is kind of just a bit of a summary. As I said, the examples of real-world evidence and naturalistic approaches in red, what I have termed the kind of real-world evidence, are electronic health records. This would, for example, include emergency medical treatment admissions, which are kind of freely available as well, large-scale registries such as T21, and hopefully something that's going to be developed in Australia. And then quite interestingly, the vast amount, I think, of naturalistic naturalistic studies we have available. I mean, service, Dave Lu David Luke spoke really nicely yesterday about the challenging experience survey, which really can show adverse events also over a longer period, which I think is really important in relating, relation to psychedelic research. We have the Global Ayahuasca Survey, for example, then slightly less psychedelic. We have um, the Global Drug Survey with Professor Adam Winstock, as well as some excellent previous studies, which are actually representative uh, using SAMHSA data from Cripps and Johansson 
which can show really the population prevalence of, say, adverse events. So quite a lot of in interesting things. Field studies include, for example, retreat and ceremony studies, excellent work being done by Simon Ruffel and the team at the Ayahuasca Foundation, as well as, um, I think it's Ramakas, looking at the Santo Dime context, um, and ICEAS looking at uh, ayahuasca and public health um, benefits and issues. So loads of really exciting and important work being done. Natural experiments would include, for example, the excellent work by David Luke and team on the D on DMT. It's a wonderful series of DMT studies just out. Self-experimentation. I mean, according to Toast and Passe, unfortunately, the times of self-experimentation have passed. But <laughs> I think judging by the audience here, it might not be the case. And let's, you know, let's not forget that a lot of self-experimentation in the 40s and 50s actually led to very valuable insights, not just for personal users, but also really to develop clinical, um, clinical trials and clinical work. Yeah, quite plenty more. And I know I'm short for time already a little bit. I do want to highlight the case studies and case series a little bit, though, um, because um, this is really... You know, obviously, yes, we, 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 they're often criticized for being anecdotal and just for providing individual output. But many of us will know that there are clinical trials going on with psilocybin and cluster headaches. But did you know that several years ago, there were about 50 case studies, a case series of cluster headache um, patients treating themselves with LSD and psilocybin. So really, you know, we can certainly argue that these clinical trials these days are pretty much based on what was termed anecdotal previously. Um, and also, I think very interesting, just sticking with pain, which obviously is quite an exciting topic in terms of psychedelics at the moment. Any of you clinicians will be familiar with the kind of quite reputable journal Pain, which currently actually has a case series of three participants who've who treated themselves with psilocybin to treat chronic pain. So really, it's really good to see also this research outside our psychedelic bubble, so to say. Lastly, before I um, sum up, I do want to highlight um, the kind of novel tech approaches just because they can provide us data and, um, which really previously wasn't even available. So these, I mean, biosensors, certain apps, uh, novel developments, um, wearables, any type of wearables and so on, which we have been seeing in medical cannabis and which probably will pay, uh, play a role also in relation to research in psychedelics. And yeah, these are really you know, areas we weren't able to look at. They can even provide real-time data, which can potentially be very valuable and more. I know I don't have too much time, so I'm going to skip this a little bit, but this is Therosil um, and the project Solis, which, uh, which is a Canadian database, quite small so far, um, providing access to of psilocybin to patients in severe medical needs throughout their special access um, program. Thanks to James Bunn, by the way, for providing this slide. And um, I you know, you can read it a bit here. I think one of the shortcomings so far and one of the benefits of actually looking at real world evidence here is the fact that ideally, or the aim is to have 200 patients throughout this page, uh, this program this year alone. However, so far there's only five patients, even though obviously there are plenty more patients who could benefit. And then, you know, the barriers include not just the, that the process is much more labor intensive than originally thought. It is very costly to patients who have to pay for the patient, uh, the therapist time themselves. But also importantly, and again, this is something that we see with medical cannabis and that we're still seeing, unfortunately. Um, major barriers are actually prescribers' lack of confidence and lack of education and their concern about litigation in terms of prescribing. Again, an area which, you know, wouldn't have come out in a clinical trial, but in terms of real-world evidence, um, we can see that these are issues that need to be addressed when we look at the psychedelic ecosystem in terms of uh, in the whole, so to say. I wanted to go into Australia in some detail, won't have time for that, very happy to discuss more. 
Um, I can see Ben Sessa is here. He'll be leading that work. So, so ask Ben. Um, this is unfortunately, this is not set in stone. So I'm relying on you, Ben, to actually get this going. A T10 to one style registry, one for psilocybin and one for MDMA. One psilocybin and MDMA are being prescribed in Australia from July this year onwards. So this is very much the aim and hopefully with the drug science involvement as well. To, to look at the data collection and analysis, just as we've done in T21, and then the reporting of the results really systematically, rigorously, standardized, homogeneously, and so on. This, you know, I would argue personally, uh, I would love to see even a little bit more qualitative interviewing there, because I assume these will be initially at least much smaller patient numbers than in medical cannabis. So really, you know, finding out a bit more in terms of the qualitative work, interviewing patients in depth in terms, in, the, in addition to the standardized um, kind of questionnaires that they will have to answer, um, would be very valuable, I think. I think I've shown you the benefits of real-world evidence. Very happy to answer questions later on the panel as well. Limitations obviously are also plentiful. Most of you are aware of it, the quality of, of data. We have to work on it. We have to be really systematic and so on. And uh, one of the areas here, obviously, with the novel data collection and technology is the ethics and privacy concern that might arise and that we really have to really keep a close eye on, that the data is used um, just as it should be. In conclusion, I hope I've shown you that the benefits of real-world evidence, at least in psychedelic research, um, outweigh the limitations. And that real-world evidence certainly, certainly can offer a very helpful way to complement RCTs and address at least some of their challenges. It's also, I want to highlight, it's neither, they're not mutually exclusive. It's neither RCTs or, um, nor uh, real world evidence. Really, they can uh, present different lenses of psychedelics. And as, you know, if we've learned one thing the last few days, I mean, psychedelics are complex. Human beings are complex. I think we need these different approaches in order to show the full picture. I think we all can just benefit from that. And we need real-world evidence to anticipate how psychedelic medicines will actually be used in real-world setting. That's why I showed the um, example of Theracil, you know, which is happening, but there are so many other issues we have to consider in addition to just the science alone. There's much to be learned outside of or in addition to RCTs, really valuable patient experiences, for example, to better understand the wider impact of psychedelics and also to explore potential um, other benefits. Um, equipoise and humility is required by all, regardless which kind of methodological approach we're using or which background we come from, I think. And really to understand the full complexity of psychedelics uh, medicines, we need innovation in clinical research, which I hope I, uh, I address now, but also in clinical practice and in ethics. And I wanted to kind of um, end with a call for action. Yes, let's use real world evidence, but collaborate and to develop and analyze systematically and let's avoid the mistakes of cannabis. So thank you.